So I'm very happy and actually honored to um, open our last, our third session for today and our last for this truly fascinating and thought-provoking conference. And we saved you the best for last. So I'm going to introduce our four speakers. And first one is going to be uh, Paula Tantaka. She's an associate professor of history and Jewish studies at Rutgers University. This year, she's a fellow at the Israel Institute for Advanced Studies in Jerusalem. Her first book, Conversion and Inquisition in the Crown of Aragon, 1250 to 1391, was published by the University of Pennsylvania Press, Middle Ages series in 2012. Her work explores Jewish-Christian relations across medieval Europe and the Mediterranean with a focus on religious conversion. Thank you for this introduction and thank you to the organizers for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Several weeks ago, quite by chance, I came across this image on the website of the British Library. It's an illuminated initial E from the start of the book of Joshua in a Bible that was produced in England during the second quarter of the 13th century for the abbot of a Benedictine abbey in Canterbury. In the foreground of this image, we see a grimacing, hairy, beak-nosed man. Crouching, he prepares to circumcise at least one of three tall, fair, naked boys. These boys gaze at flowing blue water in the upper left while standing on something red. From the textual context, it's clear that this image depicts Joshua circumcising the Israelites who had been born in the wilderness after leaving Egypt. These younger Israelites gaze at the Jordan River in the upper left while standing on dry ground at Gilgal. The polemical overtones of this image, however, are unmistakable. Indeed, this illumination may be read also as representing one of the ways in which 13th century Christians constructed contemporary Jews as harming Christians, specifically by trying to turn Christians through circumcision into Jews. According to this reading, this image depicts a contemporary Jew circumcising Christian boys. The local context in which this image was produced provides important clues to its layered meanings. During the very same decade, the 1230s, leading Jewish moneylenders in nearby Norwich were sentenced to death on charges of having seized and circumcised a Christian boy. One of these Jews was Moshe ben Abraham, whose helmeted likeness you see sketched atop this famous English exchequer roll from the year 1233. During the course of the legal proceedings in the Norwich circumcision case, whose records you see here from the plea rolls of King Henry III, the boy who Norwich Jews allegedly circumcised, who lived to tell his tale, testified that the Jews seized him and took him to the home of a Jew named Jacob, where one Jew held him and covered his eyes, while another Jew circumcised him with a small knife. According to the boy's father, we read, the Jews seized and circumcised this boy because they wanted to make him a Jew. Our artist and his patron undoubtedly were aware of the Norwich circumcision case, whose hearings were attended by King Henry III, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Dominicans, Franciscans, municipal officials, and many other clerics and laymen. Indeed, it is very likely that this case influenced this depiction of Joshua circumcising the Israelites. The claim that Jews actively sought to draw Christians into Judaism was prominent in the legislation of Christian Rome and Visigothic Spain. Between the 8th and the 12th centuries, however, as Christians rose to political, cultural, and demographic dominance in Western Europe, Christian expressions of concern about Christian attraction to Judaism and about Jews as agents of conversion to Judaism dwindled. Then, however, at the dawn of the 13th century, Christian accusations that Jews were drawing Christians to Judaism resurfaced. And over the course of the rest of the 13th century and during the 14th century, they proliferated. Popes, kings, bishops, and inquisitors claimed that Jews secretly and maliciously, through cunning maneuvers, the promotion of lies and the inspiration of the devil, I'm quoting here from many sources in a row, 
wickedly attracted, seduced, dragged, and compelled Christians to abandon Christ, apostatize from Christianity, and convert to Judaism. It's called quotation. During the 13th and 14th centuries, moreover, the themes of Christian conversion to Judaism and of active Jewish proselytizing appeared with increasing frequently appeared with increasing frequency in Christian moral exempla. Nearly all of these Christian texts referred explicitly to formal conversions to Judaism as opposed to vague Judaizing. They stressed circumcision in cases of men. Indeed, to become circumcised became synonymous with to convert to Judaism. Frequently, these texts also referred to converts taking a Jewish name and marrying a born Jew. During the 13th and 14th centuries, moreover, bishops and inquisitors in England, France, Germany, Italy, and Spain prosecuted individual Jews and multiple Jewish communities on charges related to Christian conversions to Judaism. The document on the screen from the registers of King James II of Aragon enumerates the punishments that the Bishop of Tarragona inflicted on Jews whom he suspected of sheltering two recent Christian converts to Judaism, two born Christians from Germany who traveled to Castile during the second decade of the 14th century, possibly with the circle of Rabbi Meir of Rotenburg, and who were circumcised in Toledo. During the 13th and 14th centuries, the revived charge that Jews were malevolent agents of conversion to Judaism belonged to a constellation of anti-Jewish calumnies, including ritual murder, post-desecration, and well poisoning. Christian kings, lawmakers, and chroniclers frequently referred to active Jewish proselytizing in tandem with charges of ritual murder and host desecration, and they described these alleged crimes in similar terms. Within a decade of the legal proceedings in the Norwich circumcision case, in fact, the English chronicler Matthew Paris memorialized the case as an attempted ritual murder. According to Matthew Paris, Norwich Jews circumcised the five-year-old boy in anticipation of crucifying him. By the late 15th century, it was common for Christians to imagine that Jews genitally mutilated young boys in the course of ritually murdering them. But once the 13th century re-emergence of the specific charge that Jews were active agents of conversion to Judaism, why would Christian authorities have been concerned about the possibility at a time when Jews constituted an increasingly vulnerable and reviled minority. This question is at the heart of my second book project, which I finished drafting this year as a fellow at the Israel Institute for Advanced Studies. In the time that remains today, I shall argue that its answer may lie both in developments in Christian attitudes and thought that did not solely regard Jews, and also in actual Jewish behaviors. The 13th century proliferation of expressions of Christian anxiety about Jews drawing Christians to Judaism was fundamentally tied, I contend, to broad Christian concerns about the instability of Christian identity. These concerns sprang largely from increased contact with the vast Islamic world on the one hand, and from heightened awareness of Christian groups that turned their backs on the church hierarchy and many of its teachings on the other. Reports that some crusaders, including monks, were converting to Islam and that Muslims in the Holy Land and in North Africa were forcibly circumcising Christian captives strengthened the Christian sense that unbelievers were intent on misleading the Christian faithful. 13th century popes, bishops, inquisitors, and monastic authors often treated Muslims, heretics, and Jews as three heads of a single hydra that prowled for Christian prey. At the same time as these Christian authorities charged Jews with wickedly drawing Christians into Judaism, they charged Muslims with wickedly drawing Christians into Islam, and heretics with drawing faithful Christians into heresy. The same popes, Gregory IX, for instance, articulated concerns about all three phenomena using identical rhetoric. So did inquisitors such as the Passau Anonymous, who wrote in the 1260s, the Catholic faith is assaulted by Jews, heretics, and Muslims. These groups arouse and seduce to their sects all whom they are able. The Passau Anonymous added that Jews, heretics, and Muslims all gloried in their respective laws and extolled them with authorities and explanations, and that they enticed their believers also by means of temporal promises 
and by blaspheming the Catholic faith. In addition to suggesting that, 13th, that the 13th century resurgence of the charge that Jews were agents of conversion to Judaism participated in broader Christian concerns about unbelievers misleading the Christian faithful, I argue that the revival of the charge was linked to the impulse of a small but influential circle of churchmen to convert infidels to Christianity. This impulse found expression in compulsory conversionary sermons for Muslims and Jews, in legislation aimed at improving the lives of Jewish and Muslim converts to Christianity, and in Christian monarchs and noble men and women volunteering as godparents to neophytes. Preoccupation with Jewish and Muslim conversion to Christianity, I suggest, stimulated preoccupation with the possibility of Christian conversion to Judaism and Islam. There is ample evidence that 13th century Christian authorities thought about Christian conversion to and from Judaism in tandem. For example, according to the anonymous redactor of the Jewish Christian Mallorca Disputation of 1286, it was agreed at the outset of the debate, likely in jest but suggestively nonetheless, that the loser would convert to the religion of the winner. If the Jew were to be defeated, he would be made a Christian and be baptized. If the Christian were to be defeated, he would be made a Jew and be circumcised. The image with which we began, in fact, seems to juxtapose Christian conversion to Judaism to Jewish conversion to Christianity. With his left hand, the boy in the front points to his impending circumcision. With his right hand, he gestures toward the glistening water. Could this be to draw the viewer's attention to the contrast between circumcision and baptism as rites of initiation? Could the undulating reddish substance on the ground across from the water be the blood of circumcision? There is ample evidence also that Christian authorities conceived of alleged Jewish efforts to convert Christians to Judaism in relation to Christian efforts to convert Jews to Christianity. 13th century law codes, including the Castilian Siete Partidas, treated the two phenomena sequentially. For instance, Pope Clement IV compared Jewish and Christian conversionary methods. He warned that Christians were not to use force to make Jews join the Christian faith against their will, just as, Sikut, Jews were not to seduce unsuspecting Christians away from the truth of the Christian faith into the error of Jewish unbelief. In sum, the 13th century resurgence of the charge that Jews were agents of conversion to Judaism was propelled in large part by developments in Christian attitudes and thought regarding the instability of religious identity generally. At the same time, the imputation that Jews were intent on drawing Christians over to Judaism was not entirely divorced from all reality. I contend that two social phenomena could have contributed to fueling it. The first was Jewish involvement in facilitating the return to Judaism of Jews who had converted to Christianity. <clears throat> in spite of Jewish antipathy toward and wariness of Jewish apostates, some Jews prescribed acts of penance to such individuals and administered formal rites of return, including immersion, usually in a mikvah or ritual bath, such as you see here. In addition, some Jews pressured Jewish apostates who didn't want to return to Judaism necessarily to return. The 13th century German Jewish compendium, known as Sefer Hasidim, describes, for instance, a Jewish mother and father who offered their son money to return to Judaism. Confessions and testimonies from an early 14th century inquisitorial trial described Jews in Aragon persuading a Jewish apostate that Christianity was false. It's noteworthy that bribery and verbal persuasion were prominent among the methods that Christian authorities claimed that Jews used to draw Christians over to Judaism. Moreover, there is evidence that 13th century Jews sometimes seized children who had been born to women who had converted from Judaism to Christianity in order to return these children to the Jewish folds. When such children were boys who had not been circumcised, circumcision was in order. A number of scholars have suggested, and I concur, that the five-year-old boy in the Norwich case may have been the son of Jewish converts to Christianity, whom Jews sought to retrieve. To the extent that Jewish facilitation of return to Judaism fueled the conviction of some Christians that contemporary Jews actively proselytized, 
the Jewish facilitation of return to Judaism was the object of competing interpretations. To Christians, Jewish converts to Christianity were Christian, such that return to Judaism constituted an act of Christian apostasy. To Jews, however, Jewish converts to Christianity had never ceased to be Jews, such that return to Judaism constituted an act of Jewish repentance. The second social phenomenon that I argue could have, but we can't prove it, contributed to fueling the Christian sense that Jews were malevolent agents of conversion to Judaism was the Jewish facilitation during this period of a very small number of conversions of born Christians to Judaism. Several dozen documents, several dozen cases, surface in records from the Cairo Geniza, documents from archives in Catalonia, England, and elsewhere, proceedings of the medieval inquisition, rabbinic responsa, Christian chronicles, Talmudic commentaries, and other sources. Most of these cases were recorded either because they created legal conundra for the Jewish community, or because they were intercepted by Christian authorities. This document, which I came upon in the diocesan archive of Barcelona, tells of a woman who was, quote, the daughter of a Christian woman and a Christian man, whom Jewish men and women deceitfully converted to Judaism instigated by the devil. Johanna later repented of her conversion to Judaism. She confessed all to the local bishop and was reconciled to the church. It's possible that some Christians perceived the first formal stage of the rabbinic conversion procedure, to the extent that they were aware of it, as a period of active Jewish recruitment of converts. During this first stage, this is one of the reasons I asked that question to Tommy before, um, conversion candidates lived with Jews and received instruction from Jews, sometimes for months, before proceeding to circumcision or immersion, which were the physical rites that medieval Christians viewed as corresponding to baptism. Christians could have interpreted the involvement of a great number and diversity of Jews in a single conversion to Judaism as evidence of deep and widespread Jewish commitment to bringing Christians into the Jewish fold. Jews, however, were in fact, it seems, proceeding reluctantly and guided by rabbinic law and practical exigencies. Proselytizing, in short, could be in the eye of the beholder. The conviction of some 13th and 14th century Christians that Jews were malevolent agents of conversion to Judaism, however, did not necessarily involve beholding any actual Jews at all. And here I come to my conclusion. As we have seen, Christian authorities were convinced that infidels generally were intent on misleading the Christian faithful. Churchmen's focus on converting infidels to Christianity spurred contemplation of the opposite scenario. Moreover, Christians were accustomed to conceiving of Jews as intent on harming Christians, including young Christian boys. So this specific construction of Jews that we see on the screen could have developed independently of any Christian knowledge, or rather, of any Christian perceptions or interpretations of actual Jewish behaviors. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. And our next speaker is Yannick Foss. He's a senior lecturer uh, of late and taken early medieval history at bar Ilan University. And he is one of our own here at the Center uh, for the Study of Conversion and Interreligious Encounters. He's the author of Power and Religion in Morvinia and Gaul, Columbanian Monasticism, right? Did I say that right? Yeah. Um, and the Frankish elite um, in Cambridge University <coughs> Press uh, 2014. And he's primarily interested in questions of religious identity in the barbarian West. So thank you, Avita, for that presentation, and thank you uh, to the organizers of the conference for inviting me to speak. As we survey the vista of late antique and early medieval Christian heresy, two imposing mountain peaks clearly stand out. These, of course, are Arianism and Monophysitism. Now, to simply call them heresies does injustice not only to the complexity of the philosophies they espoused, but also to the subtle and multifarious ways 
They have affected uh, the religious and political crystallization of the Mediterranean, even as we know it today. Arianism, or rather the extremely varied family of teachings that were grouped under this epithet in Catholic heresiology, was a determining factor in the formation of the barbarian kingdoms in their unique cultural landscape. Monophysites of all shapes and sizes have had an equally formative effect on the Byzantine and later Muslim East. While Syria, Palestine, Egypt, and Asia Minor remained hotbeds of religious experimentation for centuries, to a great extent the Aryan question came to predominate the annals of Western religious controversy. So obviously, Christian heresy was not all Everests and Kilimanjaros. Most of the terrain was marked by a gentler, yet perhaps equally troublesome terrain of smaller heterodoxies. It is on one of these smaller hills that I would like to climb with you today. The Bonosiacs were allegedly followers of Bonosis, a late 4th century bishop from Nysus, or modern-day niche in Serbia. The actual beliefs of this sect, as we shall see shortly, are almost impossible to reconstruct. In the literature that has come down to us, they have become ho hopelessly confused with the doctrines of other errant groups and heavily doused with heresiological cliches. What we can say is that Bonosis' theology which may or may not have had something to do with the abiding virginity of Mary, was rejected by the Synod of Capua, convened in 391 or 392. Splitting from the church, he went on to establish his own clerical hierarchy, which was still functioning two decades later. We know of this through two letters sent by Pope Innocent I to Bishop Martian of Nysus, probably Benosis' successor, and concerned with the handling of priests ordained by Benosis before and after his condemnation. It is then surprising, to say the least, that communities following the teachings of a Dacian schismatic bishop who flourished around the turn of the fourth century should resurface in an entirely different context, the post-Roman kingdom of Burgundy, separated by some 1,300 kilometers and more than 100 years from its original point of inception. Yet, it is here, of all places, that we find a cluster of evidence pertaining to this obscure heresy. To begin to see why this should be so, we must bear in mind that the sources always associate Bonosiacs with Arians. At times, the two are discussed as though they were identical. On other occasions, they are described as opposites. But one thing is clear, Bonosiacs never appear in isolation. It is again worth repeating here that what we call Arian was, in essence, a wide spectrum of doctrines, some perhaps more palatable to Nicene sensibilities than others. This all becomes especially pertinent when we recall that the evidence comes primarily from a time in which movement between Catholicism and Arianism became an especially current topic in Visigothic Spain, Merovingian Gaul, and, of course, Burgundy. So the aim of this talk will be to present the evidence for Benosiac in the 6th century West. I will argue that references to Benosiacs should be understood not as proof that a splinter group of the 4th century Illyrian sect continued to flourish in the West, but rather that this was expedient political terminology employed, at least initially, to facilitate the religious transformation of Burgundian society. The Kingdom of Burgundy, which existed from the 440s until it was conquered and incorporated into the Regnum Francorum in 534, was doubtless at the peak of its power under Gundabad, who died in 516. It was Gundabad who provided the political, legal, and diplomatic infrastructure for the kingdom, transforming it into an important player in the 6th century Mediterranean. Gundabad himself was an Aryan, but this deceptively simplistic description conceals a much more complicated state of religious affairs, and should not be taken to imply that the Burgundian kingdom itself was somehow an Aryan kingdom. Gundabad's Arianism, probably a remnant of his involvement in imperial affairs under his uncle, the Magister Militum Rissimer, was likely shared by the military contingent that followed him into Gaul. As in all things pertaining to late anti Gaul, our understanding of the Burgundians' religious affinities has been shaped, to a large extent, by the writings of Gregory of Tours. Burgundian Arianism played a prominent role in the histories, although Gregory's narrative program leaves very little room for nuance, and the members of the Burgundian royal family emerge from the text as little more than caricatures. 
whose purpose is to serve as cautionary opposites to their Merovingian contemporaries. Whatever the extent of their Arianism, it is nevertheless clear that there were Catholics among the royal family, and that Gundabad himself had a productive and amicable relationship with the Episcopate and with its most prominent member, Abitus of Vienna. So Abitus is the source for most of our evidence regarding the Nosiacs. The first piece of the puzzle appears in a theological composition, Contra Eutychianum Hyrasin, which Abitus composed at Gundabad's behest. The king, whose relationship with Constantinople was a crucial component of his foreign policy, entrusted Abitus with the task of providing him with an explanation of the Acacian Schism. Very briefly, this was a rift between Constantinople and Rome that ensued from the promulgation of an imperially sanctioned text, the Enoticon, which sought to reconcile the adherence of Chalcedon with its vocal opposition by using some ambiguous language about the unity of Christ. The product of Abitus's labors, however, was aimed not only at the monophysitic teachings of Eutyches, but also at the Arians, whom Abitus probably deemed a more immediate threat. That Abitus was able to publicly express criticism of the king's religion illustrates the growing confidence of Catholics in Gugabat's final years. Abitus's diatribe against the Eutychians mentions the Benosiac heresy, which it seems to bundle together with the teachings of one Photinus. By doing so, Abitus was accusing Benosiacs of denying the divinity of Christ, seemingly a less grievous charge than the one leveled against the Eutychians, who rejected its corporeality altogether. The confusion between Photinians and Venosiacs is not unique to Abitus. Marius Mercator, a contemporary and correspondent of Augustine and Jerome, mentions Venosiacs alongside Ebionites, and again, the followers of Photinus. A similar conflation recurs in the Collectio Dionysiana, which reproduces a letter by Pope Innocent I addressed to a certain Bishop Lawrence advising him on how to rid himself of the Photinian heretics plaguing his diocese. In his canonistic collection, Dionysius Exiguus provided the letter with a misleading heading, De Bonosiacis, quod Judais sint comparandi, of the Bonosiacs, who are comparable to Jews. So this has led some to speculate that the Bonosiac schismatics had, since their break off from the mainstream church, embraced the adoptionist views of the Photinians, the survival method. There is nothing on the theological level that makes the teachings of Benosis and Photinus especially compatible, although the sources do not allow us to accurately trace the evolution of these groups' theology in the years after Capua. In any event, the causes of this confusion are not immediately apparent. Gennadius of Marseille's Liber Ecclesiasticorum Dogmatum, probably composed around the time Avitus ascended to the Episcopal throne in Vienne, contains another Photinian Benosiac conflation. Here, Gennadius groups the Photinians, who are now called Monosiacs, with the coterie of other heresies, most notably Ebionites, Martianites, and Sephorians. His continuation to Jerome's De Viris Illustribus repeats the reference, citing the composition by a Spanish bishop, Audentius. According to Gennadius, apart from Monosiacs, Audentius' arguments focused on Arians, Manichaeans, and Sabellians. The essence of the heresy, as may be deduced from Gennadius' description, is clearly Photinian, in the sense that its adherents rejected the co-eternality of Father and Son, preferring instead to see a beginning to Christ's divinity, in other words, squarely on the homoian spectrum. Not a word is uttered in Gennadius, Mercator, or Audentius about elements of Venosis' teachings, such as Marian virginity, for example, that diverged from this theology. We may assume, then, that Abitus' sources of information regarding these heresies considered Venosiacs and Photinians essentially interchangeable. Abitus, who was doubtless familiar with Ambrose's ideas on virginity, could have employed Venosiac, which he obviously regarded as being synonymous with Photinian, as an essentially homoian heterodoxy. And we should remember this when we attempt to understand the implausible survival of Venosiac communities in the West. Abitus' other allusion to Venosiacs occurs in a letter to Gundabad's eldest son, Sigismund, datable to 501 or shortly thereafter. Sigismund is best known for his decision, probably not long before the composition of this letter, to embrace Catholicism. This marked a break with his father's religious policy, but antedated Sigismund's own ascent to the kingship by more than a decade. 
Gundabad's Aryan priesthood continued to function throughout this time, although we would imagine that its centers of power were closely linked to Gundabad's court, if not geographically, then at least in terms of their political leanings. Sigismund, who was at the time ruling as sub-king from his court in Geneva, needed to publicize his vision of the religious transition that would doubtless come when he took full power over Burgundy. This would have had to have been done carefully so as not to upset the fragile fabric of his military following or his diplomatic alliances with other barbarian courts equipped with their own Hamoyan clergies. One example that immediately comes to mind is the court of the Austro-Gothic king Theodoric, whose daughter Sigismund had only recently married. Sigismund therefore instituted an annual meeting intended to serve as a platform for debate between Catholics and Arians. It is perhaps in this context that we should read Abbotus' Epistula 31. The letter is an interesting attempt by Abbotus to gauge the religious situation and to prepare for the future. He takes an avuncular tone, speaking to Sigismund as a, follow, as a fellow Catholic and an heir to the throne. All the while, however, Abbotus remembers the true addressee of the letter, Gundaba, forcing him to take an unexpected course. Avitus addresses the king's recent nomination of a Genevan bishop as a scourge, not only for the Catholics, but for the Arians as well. From his letter, the two emerge as a united front in their opposition to this bishop, whom Avitus styles Bonosiac. How should we understand this? Episcopal nominations in the barbarian kingdom was, as we know, highly charged for formative acts of symbolic power. To give such a post to an adherent of a fringe heresy would have been an unheard of act of political self-sabotage. Thus, two options remain. Either the Bonosiacs were an established community in Geneva, deserving of a bishop of their own, or the bishop was not a Bonosiac at all, and only called by that name for polemical reasons. For the first option, no evidence has survived, although this need not necessarily imply that no such community existed. Still, if we are to believe that the bishop was an authentic Bonosiac or Votinian, we would then have to question his ability to preside over a diocese with whose clergy he would have been in schism. The second option, therefore, is that this was not a matter of Bonosiacs or Votinians at all, but of partisanship within the Aryan ranks. The politics behind these conflicts is unfortunately lost to us, and yet it is tempting to offer some speculations. Perhaps we are meant to infer from the use of the term Bonosiac, re Fortinian, that this was an especially radical Aryan bishop. From everything we know about the variety within the Homoian community, it would not be difficult to believe that the Aryan episcopate centered on Gundabad held within it competing currents. This internal tension could have been rooted in theology. Transition from a Homoian to a Fortinian style adoptionist position is, after all, not an impossible leap to make. Then again, maybe it was something else entirely. Well, Gundabad was not prepared to make the transition himself, his portrayal in Avitus's Homilia and Dedicazione Superioris Basilicae certainly sees the king as an avid supporter of the Catholics. Considering Sigismund's adoption of Nicene Orthodoxy, the religious direction in which the Burgundian kingdom was headed seemed inevitable. With the prospect of future integration with the Catholic Church looming over the Homoians, some realignment was certainly in order. Now, cordial and cooperative relations between Catholics and Arians were not unheard of, even before they were actively encouraged by politically minded kings like Sigismund. The realities of life in mixed communities would have proven stronger than any doctrinal divide. And as Ralph Matheson has demonstrated, the evidence for intense socialization between Catholics and Arians is compelling. At this juncture in Burgundian history, it is perhaps possible to imagine that necessity had produced enough theological spielraum, to use Helmut Reimus's terminology, to occasion a redrawing of confessional lines. By using Venosiac in this way, Avitus was signaling to those elements within Geneva's ecclesiastical establishments that were positioning themselves to oppose any future union with the Catholics were therefore beyond rescue. After all, unlike Arians, Putinians required rebaptism to be received into Catholic communion. So rebaptism as a condition of joining the Catholic Church was a matter of great concern for the bishops who legislated at the Gallic Synod, known as the Second Council of Arles, or Arles II for short. This council poses several difficulties. 
not only in dating it precisely, but also in determining which of the canons that are attributed to it in the manuscript evidence actually originated there. For our purposes, most interesting are canons 16 and 17, which deal with the baptismal procedures required of Photinians and Phenosiacs wishing, wishing to join the Catholic ranks. The Photinians, says Canon 16, should be made to undergo rebaptism if they wish to join. Whatever the term may have meant to the legislators at Arl, Photinians were apparently significant enough to warrant special mention. The subsequent canon addresses the Bonosiacs, but unlike what we have seen so far, groups them with the Arians as heretics who do not require baptism to join the Catholics, only chrism and the laying on of the hands. In fact, the Nosiacs and Arians are mentioned as being ex eodem eloe venientis, emerging from the same era. In many of its canons, the Council of Arl dutifully reflects the precepts of Nicaea, but on these two heresies, Arl contains additions to the original Nicaean text, which then raises the question, why? Regret regrettably, the canons do not go into any detail about the specifics of either heresy. If Matheson's dating is correct, Arl II was convened sometime between 490 and 502, so its terminus antiquen would have coincided perfectly with Abitus's letter 31. We would then do well to inquire about the circumstances of the convocation. At this point in time, Arl and its environs were controlled by the Visigoths, whose sedes regiae would have been Toulouse. During the final years of the 5th century and the early years of the 6th, pressure was steadily building between the Franks and the Visigoths. Mediterranean Gaul, with its opulent urban landscape and its lucrative maritime trade networks, was an enticing prize for Clovis, under whose reign the Franks significantly expanded their sphere of influence. Tensions finally came to a head in 507, culminating in the Battle of Vouillé, which saw the armies of Clovis bring down the Kingdom of Toulouse and effectively end Visigothic presence in Gaul. In the run-up to the battle, however, both kings were busy shoring up support from the provincial population, which might explain the free hand given to the Catholic Episcopate in a kingdom whose Gothic stratum was unabashedly Arian. Insofar it is, as it is possible to clarify the language of the canons, we may conclude that the technical understanding of the terms Bonosiac and Flutinian would not have diverged significantly from what we read in Gennadius or Avitus, both of whom then more or less at the height of their careers. In other words, we should expect some confusion about the precise meaning of the two heresies, and we would have to look for an explanation to their inclusion not in the theological challenge they posed, but elsewhere. At the very least, we may say that in their treatment of these heresies, the canons of Arl II anticipated the results of Bouillé, <clears throat> after which the need to decide the fate of the Arian clergy in Gaul took on new urgency. The Pithigothic defeat and withdrawal foregrounded the issue of Arian churches and priests in Aquitaine and their assimilation into the Catholic ecclesiastical structure. The pragmatism voiced in Canon 10 of the Council of Orléans, convened in 511, for provinces under Frankish rule, likewise echoes an accommodating approach. The Burgundian Council of Epon was a different matter entirely. Held in 517 with great fanfare, it was the culmination of a process that began some 15 years earlier with the, con with the conversion of Sigismund. A year before the council, King Gundabad died, leaving Sigismund as his heir. Now well underway to becoming a Catholic kingdom, Burgundy's first synod was meant to project the image of a confident and triumphant ecclesiastical hierarchy, standing united with its orthodox royal family. Considering the conciliatory overtures of previous years, the language of the poem is surprisingly harsh. On the subject of repurposing church structures, a problem dealt with in Orléans with such accommodating rhetoric, the Burgundian prelates had this to say. We refrain from setting to sacred uses the basilicas of the heretics, which we hold as hateful with such execration that we cannot treat their pollution as being amenable to cleansing." End quote. What had changed in the decade or so between Letter 31 and the Council of the Pong. Certainly similar ecclesiastical figures were in attendance, and if anything, the religious situation had shifted in favor of the Catholics. We would then expect a similar attitude of magnanimity to the one voiced in Orléans, which sought to smooth out any differences rather than accentuate them. There was, however, a fundamental difference between the Burgundians and the Franks. 
Mie had very powerfully broadcast Clovis's military superiority, and the accommodating attitude expressed in Guillaume was linked directly to Frankish triumphalism. Canon 10 presupposes the willingness on the part of the Arian clergy of conquered Aquitaine to merge with the Catholic Ecclesia. Once cooperation was assured, the, the council was tasked with defining the criteria governing this transition. Tellingly, Orléans never mentions what is to befall those priests who refuse to demand the demand that they be, and I quote, carefully converted and confess the Catholic faith wholeheartedly, end quote. But it is not very difficult to guess. The process whereby Burgundian churches that once belonged to Arians were appropriated by Catholics seems considerably less amicable. Firstly, unlike their neighbors to the north, the Burgundians were accustomed to Arian and Catholic clergies existing side by side. As recognized by Epon, the initial installation of the Arians in the region included forcible confiscation of Catholic church buildings, still an open sore in the tissue of coexistence. The relatively stable modus vivendi that was reached by the time Sigismund ascended to the throne would have been very poorly served by the specter of a large-scale seizure of ecclesiastical property especially when the end game would have been, as implied by the establishment of Sigismund's interfaith dialogue forum, to achieve a peaceful transition. Epon's Canon 33 was a direct result of Abbotus's reasoning on this matter, detailed, uh, explained in detail in a letter he wrote to Bishop Victorius of Grenoble. More than anything, the letter advises caution. It recognizes that the question of reappropriation is a heated one, but urges its recipient to refrain from repeating the past crimes of the Arians when they confiscated Catholic cult sites. To be sure, the tone voiced in Epon is more stringent, but it harbors an identical sentiment, namely that Arian churches are not to be reused by Catholics. Why the difference? Well, a move like the one taken at Oléan had every chance of backfiring in Britain. Catholicism was doubtless on the right path, but it was not inconceivable that Arianism would return, especially if Sigismund's brother ever managed to take power. The threat of a hostile takeover by Arian neighbors was not out of the question either. In fact, Abbotus displayed impressive foresight since both nightmare scenarios materialized within a decade of having written the letter. For now, however, Catholicism had other, less invasive ways of gaining ground, such as the royally sponsored monastery of saint louis de Bon, a powerhouse of prayer organized around a military-style liturgy dedicated to the preservation of king and country. Notably, a poem was not coy in how it used its terminology. Heretics were heretics, and now they apparently came in one size only. The utility of Benosiac as a scapegoat term for Arian and of Arian as an intermediate one had run its course, since, as the Council acknowledges, those Arians who wanted to join the Catholics had either already done so or were in the process of making the switch using the fast-track process made available to them. Those who resisted, on the other hand, would just go back to being run-of-the-mill heretics. Since, pe since power lay squarely with the Catholics, there was, for the bishops at home, no need to tiptoe around the issue. That this really was a question of breaking down Arian opposition is spelled out in Canon 29, which apportioned the mitigated penitential period to apostates returning to the Catholic fold, and likewise retained severe punishments for those who persisted in their obduracy. In the annals of the Burgundian kingdom, the Venosiacs had a fleeting moment in the sun. The theological terminology can be deceptive. In the West, Photinians and Venosiacs were not mutually transposable, not only mutually transposable, but also employed as terms of convenience. The fact that the terminologies connoted by these terms were not entirely clear to contemporaries allowed them to be employed as catch-all phrases with almost unlimited elasticity. For us, this casts serious doubt on the notion that a Venosiac community, in the sense of a theologically distinct congregation, would have succeeded in transplanting itself from Serbia to France, remaining virtually unnoticed for a century until it took the bishopric of Geneva by storm. Ironically, our so-called Venosiacs would again lie dormant for over a hundred years, re-emerging in the early 7th century, this time as the boogeymen of the Columbanian missionaries in Le Bastance. But that is a story for a different time. Thank you. Uh, introduce now Uri Shacha. Uri is an assistant professor of history at Ben Gurion University. 
where he's also a member of the Center for the Study of Conversion and to Religious Encounters. His PhD is from the University of Chicago. Um, in addition to a monograph based on his uh, dissertation, Uri is working on a collection of essays uh, provisionally entitled Voices of Conflict and Cultural Difference in the Pre-Modern Mediterranean. Thank you, Avital. Thank you, the organizers. I'd like to congratulate everybody for making it to the very, very last talk of this <laughs> conference. Uh, if it's not good, at least it's the last one. Um, okay. Odoric of Pordenone, an Italian friar who embarked on a missionary voyage to Asia, related his undertakings upon the return home in 1330, producing one of the most widely circulated texts in late medieval Europe. The story was translated to many vernaculars and is now also recognized as one of the foremost sources uh, for the anonymous man of old tradition. Although the narrative concerns the affairs of a friar on his way to preach Latin Christianity in China and India, the titles under which it circulated disclose a uh, different focus, some of which are Itinerarium de Miribilibus Orientalium, De Rebus Incognitis, Les Merveilles de la Terre Sainte. The opening lines further crystallize the dual nature of, of this enterprise. Quote, many people relate various things about the ways and the conditions of the world. <clears throat> Nevertheless, this is to know that I, Friar Odoric, having desired to cross the sea and wanting to go to the parts of the non-believers so as to bring about their, their conversion, saw and heard there many great and marvelous things. End quote. At the very least, contemporary readers viewed an indulgence in the marvels of the, exotic, of the exotic East as equally appealing as and compatible with a narrative about proselytizing the unbelievers. Despite this clear tension, however, rarely have scholars pondered the intersection of the two traditions. In placing such narratives alongside Marco Polo's Devisement and such like pre-modern bestsellers, scholars have implicitly, have implicitly suggested that their true import for their readers was in providing exotic entertainment, the missionary encounter with the heathen being no more than rhetorical lip service. Conversely, historians of the mendicant mission to, to Asia and Africa have seen these travel reports as rigorous ethnographic taxonomies necessary for the preaching that was to follow, wrapped in entertaining mirabilia, whose purpose was only to grab the attention of lay audiences. So, which is it? Mission masqueraded as travel, or a subgenre of memorabilia that used mission as a rhetorical justification for the journey. In many ways, this puzzle epitomizes the difficulties that scholars have had in giving accounts to this enterprise at large, the um, late medieval mission to the East. Already before St. Francis's momentous visit with Sultan Akami during the Fifth Crusade, the newly founded order of the Friars, Friars Minor was involved in attempts to even evangelize non-believers. But certainly after Francis' death in 1226 and the confirmation of the order's primitive rule by uh, Pope Honorius III, preaching to the infidel outside of Europe became a major part of the Mendicant ideology and practice. Soon thereafter, in 1238, Pope Gregory IX recognized the effort as one that is no less important, hence equally worthy of heavenly rewards, as crusade. Quote, from the point of view of the redemption, bringing the infidels to convert into belief in the divine word is no less important than to subdue the perfidy of the Saracens in Outremer by force of arms. End quote. Furthermore, the rise of mission not only as a theology, but also as a pedagogy, can be seen in the canons of, of the Council of Vienna, 1311. Quote, among the duties that are our responsibility is the desire to bring the stray sheep back onto the truthful path and lead them to God with the help of his grace. To that end, we should hope that the Holy Church be abundantly endowed with those who possess knowledge of languages used by the uh, unbelievers. But if, as Odoric declared in the above cited preamble to his account, the purpose of the friars is to, quote, and, uh, earn some souls for the uh, Lord God, one must admit that this project yielded very few revenues. In Benjamin Kedar's words, quote, mendicant missionizing 
in Muslim countries um, was much more conducive to filling heaven with Christian martyrs than uh, earth with Muslim converts. Indeed, Kedar has provided one of several attempts to explain the peculiarity that lay at the bottom of the Easter mission that wielded vast resources but was ultimately unsuccessful, namely its profound connection with the crusading movement. Kedar stipulates that despite the general lukewarm attitude towards the conversion of Muslims in the Latin Kingdom, leaders of the mendicant orders recognized that missionary efforts were far more successful and far less risky in areas that were under Christian control. Their hope then was that as the Franks might expand the territories under their control through crusade, so too would the mendicant enterprise expand and improve. From as early as the 1230s, therefore, friars were deeply involved in what they perceived as two sides of the same coin. They were staunch advocates of crusades, preaching and recruiting incessantly, while slowly expanding their network and presence across Asia, expecting that the two complement each other and would soon overlap. Other scholars have pointed to another way in which the uh, preaching, despite its meager success and questionable feasibility, was imagined to be tied to a viable political program. Bernard Hamilton, and to a certain extent, Susan Akbari, have drawn a connection between missionary efforts in Asia and fantasies of Christian sovereignty in the East, ruled by that elusive figure, Prester John, who would vanquish both the Mongols and the Muslims and revive the crusading enterprise. But most studies on the mendicants in Asia focus on its most defining characteristic, namely that it almost invariably involves the violent death of the friars and often their posthumous canonization. As Christopher McEvitt says, it was a magical solution to the previous failures to expand the grip of Latin Christianity in both territory and the hearts of local populations. Simply put, uh, McEvitt says, martyrdom is a story in which one cannot fail. These brave preachers are seen to have offered a narrative that features the spreading of the truth of Christ's word through the witness of martyrdom, thus promoting the uh, unifying ambitions of the, universe, of the universal church, regardless of political incompetence and internal factions. In other words, as James Ryan would argue, and I paraphrase, paraphrase mendicant mission to Asia was never primarily about converting the heathen, nor was it ever attached to fantasies regarding the political expansion of Christendom. Its purpose was to achieve a spiritual presence in India and the Levant through a performative witness of Christ's word. My aim in this talk is to shift our attention from the experience or even the ambition of individual preachers and instead to look at the work that their narrative was expected to achieve in its literary context. As works of missionary fiction, the itineraries composed in the 13th and 14th centuries enjoyed tremendous success, despite the fact that ultimately they depict an unsuccessful project. In this genre, I would hope to show, language, and more specifically translation, played a crucial role in how the plot was thought to be about the salvation of souls, even as very few people were seen to actually convert to Christianity. The work of one compiler might serve to illustrate my point. The Flemish monk, Jean Le Long, joined the Benedictine Abbey of saint bertin in 1340, of which later he became the abbot until his death in 1383. In uh, 1351, Jean took up a highly ambitious project, which included the translation into Old French of the following six items. First is the Flower of the History of the East, originally, originally written in Old French by the Armenian historian Hatem in 1307, and then translated into Latin. Jean then translated the Latin back into Old French. Then there's three uh, travel texts by mendicant preachers. The Dominican Ricola de Monte Croce, uh, whose uh, book is Lib uh, Liber Peregrinationis, uh, the Franciscan Odoric of Pordenone, and the Dominican Wilhelm von Bordenzele, um, whose title is, uh, was translated as the Traité de l'État de la Terre Sainte. In addition, there were two items pertaining to the Mongol Ilkhanate. Uh, the first is letters from Pope Benedict XII to the Grand Khan and an anonymous treatise whose title was Livre de l'État de Grand Khan. In two of the five complete surviving manuscripts, this corpus of translated texts is bound together with Marco Polo's Devisement and the book of John Mandeville. 
John de Long, then a Benedictine monk, collated these texts of diverse character and religious affiliation. The preaching and occasional mention of martyrdom is fitted within a larger ambition of encompassing knowledge about the East within an ecclesiastical framework. What is more, Jean rendered these texts into Old French, an idiom that had already gained purchase as a transnational language of prestige and dominance whose pedigree made it appropriate for depicting the tributary empires of the East. And here I quote Sherat and Shida. Although there is very little preaching and even less converting, it seems that what Jean was hoping to achieve is a rendering of Eastern geography into a spiritual program of a distinct character. This compendium, I wish to argue, is neither purely instrumental as a handbook for those planning to embark on future missions, nor entertaining for those with a taste for exotic literature. Rather, this corpus and others like it stand alone as spiritual attempts to incorporate the diversity of customs, faiths, and geographical phenomena into a soteriolo soteriological framework. In order to understand where this intellectual impulse emerged, let us go back to one of the first large-scale mendicant itineraries of the 13th century. Not much is known about William of Rubric, except that he took part in the Seventh Crusade, and that he belonged to the Dominican Holy Land province, probably before the Crusade, and certainly after his return from his famous mission to the Grand Han between the years 1232 and 1234. The journey of this Flemish Dominican was firmly grounded in a tangible political pretext. Rumors about the conversion of the westernmost Mongol ruler, Sartak, to Christianity led, led uh, King Louis IX, who had only recently arrived in Akko after his embarrassing defeat in Egypt, to initiate a diplomatic attack. The king is said to have sent William in order to, quote, inform him, the uh, Sartak, uh, who is imagined to have uh, uh, converted to Christianity, to inform him of what is in the interests of the whole of Christendom, end quote, hoping to strike an alliance with the Mongols against the Saracens in and around the Holy Land. The rumor, however, soon prove, proves to be incorrect, and William's unsettled hosts asked that he present his peculiar offer first to Batu, ruler of the Western Mongols, and then to Mote, the Great Khan. But as the fantasy of political alliance grounded in a shared creed is shattered, the Christianization of the Mongols is revealed as the true, or rather the other, reason for William's trip. Quote, it is a duty of our faith to preach the gospel to all men. When we heard that Satrach was a Christian, I made way to him, and the Lord King uh, Louis IX of the, Fre of the French uh, sent him a letter couched in agreeable terms. Thus, with the double purpose at play, political and missionary, William embarks on the long trip to Karakoro. From start to end, William shows great concern with the languages of the peoples he meets and is anxious as to the ability to converse in an effective way. In Sarai, for example, the Dominican warns Batu lest he think that without proper faith in God, his vast earthly possessions would turn into heavenly rewards. But this moment of confident admonishment only turns into a farce. Instead of taking in the uh, reproach solemnly, what happens instead is that, quote, at these words, Batu gave a slight smile, and him and the other Mongols began to clap. And it continues, my interpreter was dumbfounded, and I had to reassure him not to be afraid. So his message was completely lost. Later, William enters a shrine where local monks are seen to meditate in silence. I tried, he says, by many means to induce them to speak, but completely without success. And another time, he engages in a debate, in a debate with an idolatrous priest regarding the, regarding the nature of God. After agreeing that God is one and uh, invisible, William wanted to argue further. But again, his language becomes obscured by the exigencies of translation. My interpreter, he says again, who was tired and incapable of finding the right words, made me stop talking, he says. <laughs> William concludes this encounter by an arrestingly uh, revealing observation. He says, being intermingled with the Nestorian Christians and Saracens, through frequent debate, I assume, this tribe of which he talks, the Uyghurs, reached the point where they believe in only one God. Along 
alongside William's fundamental belief in the power of dialogue in drawing people closer to the true faith, his preaching in the East is seen to be locked in a constant inability to find the right words, or the concern of whether his words are indeed understood correctly. But on a literary level, the narrative achieves a performative effect, like the historians that repeatedly act as purveyors of Christianity, if a heretical and flawed one, so too does the language that William used to encapsulate the litany of people and customs that he meets along the way. The political pretext for the journey, Louis IX's letter offering an alliance with the allegedly converted Mongol prince, proves to be an efficacious frame story, and the travel of William's speech in his attempt to achieve salvation through comprehensibility becomes the principle that drives the plot forward. One may begin to appreciate how 100 years later, when a crusading kingdom in the Orient was no longer in existence and could no longer provide the political contours of missionizing fantasies, there could emerge a literary taste for missionary fiction that showcased the work of language in bearing the promise of salvation, even as the preaching depicted rarely resulted in conversion. Dominican friar Ricardo de Montecroce marks a transitional point in this process. Ricardo left for the East in 1290 and spent a decade in Baghdad where he learned Arabic and became intimately familiar with the various faiths that, uh, and scriptural communities that inhabited the Near East. During his sojourn, Ricardo witnessed the fall of uh, the Latin Kingdom and he responded to the need to redefine the terms through which mendicants were to think about their Eastern down itineraries. Upon his return home in the year 1300, Ricardo composed treatises that became that came to play an important role in the history of polemical literature. His relatively short travel account, uh, Liber Peregrinationis, stands out from the other surviving treatises in adopting a slightly less acerbic tone and in interlacing his learned uh, opinions about other creeds in a wealth of cultural and material observations. Chronologically, uh, it is the earliest of the treatises included in John de Long's aforementioned compendium, and its inclusion is indeed peculiar. The Latin original declares that the purpose of the book is to, is to inform all those who wish to spread the faith of Christ. The old French, instead, simply lists the things that Ricardo quote, saw and found in the East, which are kingdoms, provinces, customs, laws, letters, faiths, heresies, and of course, marvel. This rendering, then, marks the transition from the itinerary as an instrument for the potential preacher to a work of fiction where exotic places and people serve as the background for a plot in which the history of salvation unfolds. Adjusting to the new reality uh, in the now Mamluk dominated Near East, Ricardo could no longer hinge his itinerary on a crusading fantasy of political domination. Instead, he turns to a biblical proof text. Just as Christ took to the road with his family, heading to Egypt in order to escape Hadrian's decrees, so too did Ricardo embark on his pilgrimage in response to political turmoil in the region. Like William of Rubruck before him, Ricardo turns to historians to draw a complicated map of allegiance and faithfulness. They, on the one hand, refused to allow him to preach his creed in their chur churches, but at the same time, they are shown to recognize that he, quote, had traveled from a distant land for the sake of their salvation, end quote. Somewhat like William as well, Ricardo devotes a great deal of attention to languages spoken in the East and often blames doctrinal and theological faults on linguistic inconsistencies. Probably not, I have not, no time to go into the intricacies of uh, one uh, inconsistency regarding the Nestorian creed. I will say, however, that Ricardo studies the usages of Arabic and Chaldean, or Syriac, terms, but John instead places these terms in Latin substitutes. When it comes to critique on Islam, and especially on the language of the Quran, Ricardo is unyielding. Particularly interesting, however, is how these linguistic observations play themselves out in John's translation. Ricardo scrutinizes the Quranic story in which Iblis, or the devil, is said to have been an angel, an angel who refused to prostrate before Adam. 
this, he says, is irrational, as the adoration that was expected of the angels toward Adam is only appropriate for God. Nicoldo further elucidates that the word the Quran invokes is one that denotes devotion to God alone. Hence, for him, the expectation that the angels would venerate the earthly creature on those terms is senseless. But instead of the Arabic uh, term, John displays the word in Latin, devotio. Ricoldo continues, It is additionally unlikely that God would forget the precept that would have rendered the veneration added prohibited, which is uh, from Deuteronomy 6.13. Fear the Lord your God and serve Him alone, which is to say, venerate God, not Adam. John provides first the Latin version of this verse, and then its translation into French. In other words, here as elsewhere, Jean replaces Ricola's highly learned and virulent linguistic argumentation with an imprecise sense that uses Latin as the placeholder of all things Eastern, be they Nestorian or Muslim. Nestorians continue to play an important role also in later works of missionary fiction as personifications of the gradations of comprehensibility and salvation. Odoric of Pordenone, for example, relates one of the most vivid and widely circulated accounts of the martyrdom in Tana, in India, in which four friars were punished for blaspheming Islam and the Prophet Muhammad. Having arrived in Tana in unexpected circumstances, uh, the four were summoned to the local Qadi, for it was thought that, quote, they are learned men of great scriptural knowledge, and that it would be good to dispute with them about the faith. In this makeshift symposium that ensues, the Nestorians are the first to make a statement in which they reject the double nature of uh, Christ. And I should clarify that I'm using, I'm drawing on Jean's uh, translation here, because in the Latin, this position is attributed to the Muslims. In response, Thomas Tolentino, one of the friars, quote, showed them by reason and examples the truth of, of the faith that Jesus Christ was truly God and man, so that the unbelievers were aren't able to say otherwise, end quote. But when in a typical turn of events, the friars declare that Muhammad is the son of perdition, the country is enraged and decides to have them burned at the stake. Not only the local spectators, however, are, however, are astonished when the bodies of the four friars prove resistant to the blaze of the fire. The sultan uh, becomes uh, the, excuse me, the Sultan too comes to believe that the friars are saints and rebukes the Qadi for having them beheaded. Indeed, Odoric's prose features encounters that bring together protagonists whose religious identities are vague and whose stakes are ambiguous, like the heretical Nestorians or the faithful Sultan. Take, for example, an episode that took place when the Franciscan was in uh, Kinsai in eastern, uh, eastern China. Excuse me. His host, a convert to Christianity, we're told, takes Odoric to a shrine and introduces him to uh, the local monk. He says, this is a French monk who comes from the end of the world, where the sun sets. He came here for the sake of the life and salvation of the Khan. The host then asks the monk to show Odoric some strange things, okun Strange things that he could then recount when he returns back home. Agreeing to entertain the French visitor, the monk steps outside, sounds the bell, and immediately 3,000 animals descend from the surrounding mountains in an orderly fashion. All of them, says Odoric, have human faces. After feeding the animals, the monk sounds the bell again, and the meadow is emptied instantaneously. Odoric is amazed and asks his host, the Christian convert, to explain. These were the souls of noble men, he says, which they, the local monks, feed for the love of God. Again, this position is attributed to the convert, whereas in the Latin, it is attributed to the Buddhist monk. He further elucidates the convert. The more noble the soul of man, the more noble beast it enters. Conversely, the souls of villains and the poor enter into vile beasts of evil serpents. Odoric is, of course, appalled and says in reproach, these were irrational beasts that could not possibly be thought to entertain the souls of noble men. But the convert remains steadfast, steadfast in, his, in his belief. The marvel that Odoric witnesses place the convert and the monk 
and possibly also the great Khan, the salvation, the salvation of whose soul is said to be Odoric's objective on the same scale of comprehensibility and history. They are seen to inhabit the same space as the Sultan and the historians from the previous anecdote. Here, as elsewhere in the Relatio, the prose thematizes the work and the transformations that it is anticipated to undergo. It, is, it has Odoric's host, mentioned above, ask the monk for a marvel, so that if Odoric gets back to his home country, he may be able to say, I have seen such and such strange things, which of course he did after having translated his conversation and translated again by Jean. More than a work of conservation, <coughs> Jean's is a project that conveys its ambitions through translation, so much so that it, it involves, pronounced, uh, un involves pronounced acts of retranslation. Hayton's work was originally uh, in French, as stated above, but John renders it independently back to Old French from that. Similarly, there are good reasons to believe that Odoric narrated his story to his scribe William in Old French, and possibly the earliest circulating copies were in the vernacular. Furthermore, in the 1330s, Jean de Vigné already produced a translation of Odoric's itinerary, which Jean Lelon could have used, but instead he opted to render it independently. One moment. Throughout the compendium, as seen above, Jean's translations proved to realign some of the religious and linguistic stakes that appeared in the original. Odoric, for example, deploys a detailed account of a large and highly luxurious idol that he says is surrounded by houses inhabited by Nestorians. In Jean's translation, instead, the idol is seen to be found inside a Nestorian church. Are all of these simply cases of sloppy translation that is incapable of recognizing the difference between Nestorians and Buddhists? Or was this compendium created for a French-speaking audience that was expecting to read stories about a place where all these unlikely mixtures were possible, expecting perhaps that the successful translation into the European vernacular would set them all on a familiar spiritual intellectual space? It could very well be that this compendium and others like it was popular because readers turned only to the chapters detailing the exotics of the East. I suggest, however, that its efficacy lay also with the work that missionary fiction did in accommodating layers of both imperial dominance and ecclesiastical ambitions. The appeal of these stories owes to the fact that they are not necessarily expected to result in the conversion of the heathen, but in creating a language to think of places and peoples as sharing in the history of salvation. Translation seems to have been conceptualized as the prime vehicle through which to convey precisely the conversion into salvation that the mission to the East sought to achieve. Thank you, Ori, and thank you for the three beautiful, beautifully presented uh, papers. And our respondent is Pierre Capelli. Uh, he is an associate professor of Hebrew and Judaic studies at uh, Kafuskari University of Venice and editor in chief of the journal uh, Chinoch, Historical and Textual Studies in Ancient and Medieval Judaism and Christianity. His research focuses on the history of text and ideas in Judaism from late antiquity to the Middle Ages and on medieval Jewish Christian polemics. Thank you, Eric, and thanks to the presenters of today's panel, of this afternoon's panel. Um, oh my God, I'm, I'm so embarrassed because in Italian academia there's no such thing as the role of a respondent. We don't have responses in our conference, and so I'm going to have to try to, 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 to play the Italian, so to be theatrical, I'm going to gesticulate and I'm going to pretend that I actually know what I'm going to be talking about for the next, next few minutes. But you will appreciate it because it's going to be only a few minutes. So, first of all, the, the thanks, uh, um, and in this case, it's not just duty, but it's also uh, way more of a pleasure to thank uh, time to thank the organize the conveners of this conference, this extremely beautiful and involving conference, 
which for me is uh, even more, uh, possibly even more meaningful than for most of you, because it comes just at the end of a, of a research stay here as Professor Alech at uh, Ben Gurion at, uh, at the Center for the Study of Conversion. I've been here for three months, so I've experienced both the fantastic hospitality and the uh, incredibly uh, fruitful intellectual climate of the center, of which this conference has been the, the most perfect and fulfilled manifestation. And also, I have enjoyed the, the perfect organization of my stay uh, by Battelle, uh, who was a nice. So this has been by far the, the, the most, at the same time, the most productive and the most pleasurable uh, research stay abroad of my whole and last long career. Um, now, um, over these days we've been uh, dealing with lots of case studies where religious conversion, or in a wider sense, interreligious contact, were tightly interwoven with language issues. And I here use the word language in a metalinguistic acceptation. Because uh, today we have had um, uh, uh, already a lot of Foucault, which is great, of course, but the cocktail that I'm going to serve to you over the next minutes is much more, it's like one part of Gramsci and another part of Rorty. If it ever comes out as a cocktail, I'm going to call it the linguistic term for dummies. And of course, <laughs> you're not the dummies, I am. So in a Rortian uh, post-linguistic term perspective, language brings about conversion, or rather creates conversion. Language is therefore also bound to create the object of conversionary activity. It can thus be seen as an agent of conversion in its own right. And in this function it can be described as Emily did yesterday, I think you were answering uh, a question, it was not writing your paper, <laughs> but you described um, this function as a set of techniques that includes, of course, a vocabulary, a grammar, a repertoire of tropes that are all subject to modification through history. For instance, uh, the rhetorical tropes in Gregory Bon Compagni's uh, conversionary sermons that you showed us to be innovative vis-a-vis -vis the ones that were earlier commonly used in, in the genre, if I got it right. And I can multiply the examples. I remember, for instance, Paul remind us of the careful attention dedicated by Michel No to um, lexical choices in his rendering of uh, Quranic terms into Latin. And also uh, Gideon's, uh, if I quote correctly from the note, if my notes are correct, Gideon used the term tactics to talk about transculturation politics, transculturation of myths in Protestant mission to Southeast Asia. Uh, defining missionaries, and this get the function of the role of missionaries as translators of native cultures for the sake of their own, the missionaries' culture. So, uh, conversion and interreligious contact at large are games that are or are also played in the language arena. Labeling, defining, cataloging otherness is a core rhetorical device within the macro genre of conversion literature and of literature about conversion. Um, this is what we saw today particularly, I think, in Yaniv's paper, which focused about one of the possible rules of such a possible grammar of the genre. And this rule would, if I got it right, would more or less go thus. The nominations of rivals survive the very presence or even the existence of the writers and turn into generic labels of derogation that can be applied at the speakers or the writers' convenience. Such is the case of, Bonosia, of the Bonosians, a term that, after only one century from the origin of the group it originally defined, in the Kingdom of Burgundy have already lost any connection with the original and basically forgotten Bonosians. Uh, which is much the same dynamics that we see at works in, with terms, with other terms, like Bogomile, for instance, in 14th century Italian literature, where it indicates anyone whose purported sexual behavior did not conform to the tenets of Catholic morals. Or another term like Bulgos, Bulgarian, which was originally used as a synonym for Bogomile, uh, that is a substitute for a religious denomination, and then became a term labeling male homosexuals, as in French uh, Bucher or in, in, 
an English uh, book. By the same token, in Italian atomic realistic poetry from the late Middle Ages, Judeo was used as um, was used to mean any Christian who once again did not conform to official Catholic standards of moral behavior, especially sexual behavior, or of religious belief. Sometimes it totally overlaps with the meaning of Christian heretic, even when the purported heretic had nothing whatsoever to do, to do with any Judaizing tendency. Alexander, Alexander brought to my attention these days um, an 18th century conversion narrative about a Swede converting to Judaism with no Jewish presence whatsoever in Sweden and reporting that people used to tell their children in, in Sweden, stop crying or the Jew will come and get you. I wonder whether this might be also be the case with the, term, with the, the variegated usages of a term like minim in earlier rabbinic literature, early, uh, early and less early. To come to Uri's, Uri's paper, we also saw that the issue, the issue that can be defined, uh, if I got it right, as mission literature disguised as travel literature, or rather actual travel literature using mission as a rhetorical justification for the travel, so if this is the issue, it is once more an issue, an issue in communication, that is, in language, or in actual languages, Sprachen. William of Rubruck was obsessed with the problem of mutual understanding with the Mongols by means of a common language, which, to my memory, brings us close to Matteo Ricci's interest for the even more articulate, yet structurally similar issue of the translatability of cultural contents between Christendom and Confucius. Confucians. Uri's conclusion, I quote, I quote from the draft, uh, Uri's conclusion is that the appeal of these stories owes to the fact that they are not expected to result in the conversion of the heathen, but in creating a language, once more, to think of places and peoples as sharing in the history of salvation. So the theological concern is certainly more important, but I presently rather focus on the stretching of genre categories that this literature implies. And a comparison occurred to my memory between the genre analyzed by Uri and Jewish pilgrimage literature from the same period, uh, which I would uh, roughly subdivide into main groups. One, there is a, a sort of lonely planet travel literature interested in describing the holy places, the Jewish communities encountered along the way, the sepulchres of the holy men, but on a ra remaining, keeping to a rather descriptive level, the religious, per the religious perspective being, I'd say, rather perfunctory than persuasive. And I'm thinking of uh, Benjamin of Tudela, I'm thinking of the uh, of Regan's book, Sibouf, authors who devote the last parts of their works to the account of their returns to, the home, to their homelands. And then the other group is actual Aliyah literature, with no description of any return to the, to, from the land of Israel. Works that were meant to foster the faith, sometimes even the messianic expectation of both the writer and his, and their audiences, their readers, their readerships. Uh, of course, the names are uh, Yehuda Alevi, uh, Songs of Zion, and even, um, for instance, the letters um, of Avadi of Bakhtin. So if we consider, as Harvey did in his recent rereading of Herman of Toulouse Opuscula, if we consider conversion as an ongoing process that has mainly to do with awakening and deepening one's spirituality and piety, and where shifting religions is but one of the several steps of a long stage, then this Aliyah literature, Halevi of the other can be considered as conversion literature as well. The gap between the traditional genre definitions of mission literature and pilgrimage literature is thus further reduced, as in Uri's readings of, reading of the sources. Reconsidering conversion as a linguistic deed and language as the core dimension of the phenomenon in its representation and recollections, which is what was originally the title of our panel, will necessarily also um, involve reconsidering, rethinking, the traditional system of subgenres in which we have been accustomed to subdivide conversion literature and literature about conversion. And I come to Paola's paper, um, 
we saw today Karen and Uriel um, stretching the traditional boundaries of the concept of agency to include uh, a, a gender that is usually not considered uh, as an agent. And in the very first panel of the conference, uh, in, uh, especially in Bruce's and Nerit's papers, we um, also witnessed a widening uh, of the concept of agency in conversion in the sense that texts and images can be agents of conversion. So today, Paolo showed us revealing example of the bi examples of the bias underlying representations of Jews and Christian illuminated manuscripts from Britain from the long 13th century. Uh, now, does this connect to the wider issue of language and the creation of a common discourse ground, to some extent, maybe even a community of discourse between converters or converter and converted? In my pretentious opinion, uh, it does, but it does for the wrong reasons. In all the cases, if I am not mistaken, in all the cases we have been going through these days, um, a claim to their addiction and therefore to exclusivism was present on one, if not on both, the sides involved. The psychological construction of interreligious contact, at least in our cases, was systematically unbalanced. On one side being determined to bring about conversion of the other side to the former's religion and to the former's model of authority and power. The problem, of course, is that what Paul yesterday called uh, the theological anxiety of monotheisms, or that we can, could even label the inherent violence of monotheisms, religions that are no longer as much into, into answering the primal needs of man and the finding his place in the natural world, as they are into granting this catological individual, individual salvation, and this, uh, now I refer to what Rosie was calling today the, the eruption in Western tradition of a teleological approach to history. Of course, it's not just about granting this catological uh, individual salvation, but of, uh, granting metaphysical and meta-historical legitimation to models of authority and power. Now, there was a strong feeling, correct me please if, uh, if I am mistaken, Rosie, but uh, there was a, a strong feeling you know, in, in the text you, you presented to, her, to us, a feel, or rather actual evidence, more than just a feel, of religion as uh, you being used as instrumentum regni, and religion superimposed as a huge fig leaf uh, on dynastic expansionism and, and actual historical violence. So uh, I wonder, I was wondering while you were talking about what I, the Icelanders could have done had they not chosen to convert willingly. Was there a serious alternative? I don't know. Just a provision. <laughs> so, um, um, cases of forced conversion in both directions between Judaism and Christianity like the ones that Paolo described to us today, would have been unthinkable, for instance, in the Roman Empire of the Classical Age, where satirical poets, such as Horace in the first, in the first century, Juvenal in the second, could describe Jews openly proselytizing in the streets, inviting the Gentiles to join them in fasting and in uh, observing the, sh uh, the Shabbat. So the very macro category of conversion acquires quite differently, quite different shades of meaning possibly even more than classical 50, when, when, they are seen, when, when it's seen on the background of, the, of what was uh, um, aptly and famously called by John North the supermarket of religions of late antiquity, or, on the contrary, on the background of what, against the background of what was equally aptly and equally renownedly called by Bob North the formation of persecuting society in the high and less high Middle Ages. This is a problem that has, has been, for instance, and still is very, very deeply felt in the Catholic Church since the end of, of the Second Vatican Council, that is from, from the, the first half of the 1960s. The problem of the relationship, or rather the problem of the difference between mission and ecumenism. I conclude, I'm, I'm entertaining the possibility that interreligious encounters, and specifically religious conversion, are, as I said, again played in the language arena 
and are possibly best defined and best understood in terms of interaction of languages. And now I mean, once again, not strategy, but discourses. So art, manuscript illumination, is one of these languages, of course. Uh, this should be true even when we consider conversion not or not only as a social phenomenon, but rather in its inner dimension, uh, that is, primarily as a psychological and emotional experience, that is, when it is all not about shifting religions, but about changing one's religion, deepening its way into the self. And maybe this could even be, I wonder, a fruitful path for further research, or even for a further conference at the Center mm -hmm. for the Study of Compassion. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre, and thank you, everybody, for the beautiful lectures, and we open the floor for questions or remarks. Um, yes. Yeah, um, well, thank you make um, a comment to Rudy's paper. First of all, um, thank you for all your observations on gender norms, linguistic choices, which I think are very difficult. Um, I think, however, that you could um, maybe, um, I mean, maybe I could say a comment on the, on the genre of travel writing in this period, because it is a temptation to generalize. But we're talking about a relatively small number of texts, each of which is usually very different from each other. So in fact, we're talking about many sui generis, sui generis, uh, unique cases of, of, of uh, rather than a, a general uh, pattern. Um, I do think you can have a chronological sequence, and I think you, you suggested it. But I think you could sharpen that chronological sequence. Uh, I would say that in the in the first half of the, I mean, in, for much of the 13th century, there is a real missionary model which you rightly connected to crusading ideology. There's a real hope. The Mongols as a poss possible converts and a geopolitical vision, and um, and in the case of uh, John of Piano Carpini and William of Rubruck, um, you, you, you were with the Franciscans, um, both Franciscans actually, uh, uh, they are um, really doing ethnography and they're doing diplomacy, they're doing politics and they're doing mission together. It's a, and, and for them, getting understanding the Mongols is important. And, the kinds of texts they're producing, I agree with you, are very different from what comes later. Um, and uh, I would, yeah, you, you mentioned Ricardo Monte Croce at the point. You could say that Marco Polo is also, interestingly, still part of the earlier uh, mode in its production, but of the latter mode in circulation, because he, 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 he when he's in Kuila's he's there's really still the idea of bringing missionaries. You haven't uh, mentioned John of Monte Corbino, but he actually builds a church in the Jink, Catholic Church, and uh, he clearly belongs to the kind of we will make real converts and build a church model still. And this is still late 18th century. I agree that things change very much in the following century. I think Portinoni is very untypical, actually. It's the extremely uneducated level of analysis for a friar. And I think that that creates big important questions um, about his text. I think he's very not representative of earlier accounts by other missionary travelers. And then I think general long, I think that, that there we really, I would agree with you, but I think you could go further actually. We really see um, um, a, a different direction. It's no longer about understanding other cultures at all. It's about recreating a vision of Christianity in a moment of crisis, where the other has a place. Um, and, but I, I, there has been many, lots of literature about the possible connections between John Iran and John Mandeville. Um, uh, and I think John Mandeville shows that even more clearly. John Mandeville is about converting Christi Christians to Christianity. That is what happens in the end of the genre, basically. It's no longer about converting anyone else to Christianity. It's about converting Christians to Christianity. Um, look, thank you so much. A lot to think about. I, the one thing I want to say is that really I um, wanted to, to frame the way I think about this through the compendium. So the question is not so much what, um, uh, what you know, texts like Ricordo and even individual friars who had some kind of ambition 
both in going and then in now reading, and as you make a, you make a really interesting uh, uh, distinction between the production and circulation, but the, then the question is how it is fitted within a completely different uh, intellectual project that see that views uh, has different ambitions and is mapped onto the world in a different way, and the choice of old French or old Italian or whatnot in a completely different uh, so this creates an opportunity of uh, of um, of uh, comparing the, the, the maybe the process that that had undergone between the production of these two things and I, I mentioned once again not just not just this compendium but the, the formation of these compendia say mid 14th century so that was kind of uh, helpful thank you. Yeah, thank you. A question to Paola. I would uh, share this observation of the obsession of uh, Jewish proselytizing in the 13th, uh, 14th century. And I have the impression that it is particularly intense at the time of the collapse of Muslim Andalus and the phenomenon of uh, enslaved Muslims who are said to be converted by Spanish Jews to, uh, to Judaism. There's quite a literature on this from the Christian side as well as from the Jewish side. Would you see this connection as well? Thank you so much for your comment. I actually haven't considered that in detail. It's something I need to learn more about and I'm very glad that you mentioned it. Most of my um, data is quite scattered geographically and not linked to a particular region of Western Europe. Uh, although a lot is happening in the Mediterranean at this time that I think then radiates, but not necessarily specifically Spain, um, that the Pope is very aware of, and therefore he writes, you know, issues bulls and writes letters to prelates all over the West. But I am not specifically um, knowledgeable enough about the literature you're mentioning. I'd love it if afterwards you could give me more details about that. Thank you. Thank you all three for um, engaging paper. Um, just one comment to Yannick before I um, move to asking Paula. Um, you said that martyrdom never fails. Um, <laughs> um, oh, oh, we said that. All right, sorry. Um, um, actually, Sefer Chazidim, which uh, Paula invoked, um, does the, uh, talk of, a, of two guys who fail to, <laughs> to, to, to be martyred. And they are pondering on what should they do now uh, after they tried and it didn't work. So maybe it's, I, I'm not sure if it's made, if it's a, if it's a comical remark or, or anything else, but it, there there's some theological issues there as well. Um, thank you for um, Paula for the uh, um, opening up of this issue of Jews, heretics, Muslims, uh, and I was wondering if you can if you saw in your sources a discrepancy between how the church uh, and the people who write um, engage these, uh, these three groups. Um, I was thinking that uh, Jews and heretics being an eternal kind of um, menace within society, sometimes clandestine, sometimes where, where people are unaware of them. I mean, part of the reason why we have 12, 15 um, Labyrinth Council decrees about marking out the Jews is because sometimes they're indistinguishable just like the heretics who are undistinguishable, and as opposed to Muslims who are uh, very uh, uh, prominent enemies, but they are on the battlefield, they are out there you know, on the frontier. So this, this may be, um, this is you know, me thinking out loud, I'm not sure that the sources uh, spell this uh, or, or spell this that way, but is there anything of that nature that you've seen? Um, um, just, yeah, that's about it. Thanks so much. So there's some interesting distinctions, but what really struck me were the commonalities. Because I was expecting, right, so Muslims represent a military threat that's sort of unique and it's very much going on right then and there, or nearby, everyone's aware of it. Um, so methods of drawing, seducing Christians into those faiths. Heretics are preaching is one of the ways in which they are portrayed that Jews are portrayed as debating in dangerous ways with Christians, but not as preaching. And I, I am not aware of Muslims 
and abducting, physically seizing, absolutely, and sometimes colluding with Muslims and abducting and colluding with heretics, and that's something I haven't touched and not sure where to go with it yet. But um, in all three cases, we have um, these the idea that Jews, Muslims, and heretics are assuming false appearances. They're preying specifically on the vulnerable, whether it's children, whether it's the simple-minded. So we have like, the same rhetoric with all three groups. Yeah. Captives. Um, and Jews and Muslims, so much the Muslims about whom, for example, Gregory the Ninth is writing, are in Hungary, not in Spain, and not in the Near East. And he write, he issues papal bulls using the exact same rhetoric about Muslims and Jews, like 1231, 1233, 12, you know, over is the same period of time, saying, for example, that. Jews and Muslims who aren't supposed to be in positions of power, aren't supposed to be willing power over Christians, are abusing those positions to seduce Christians into their fates. So they're the Muslims and the Jews who are actually being uh, treated very similarly and being accused of doing the exact same things. Also, in the early 1230s, we have both Jews and Muslims accused of seducing Christian women romantically, pretending to be Christians. And then later letting them know who they really are and making those Christian That's women. That's the spirit of 1215. Yes. Yeah. In Therefore, they should have been wearing a badge, right? Like, if only they had dressed distinctively. So it's, as I look at it more closely, it's breaking down in ways that I hadn't expected. So, like Effie, I have a question for Paula, prefaced by a comment about martyrdom, um, which is that I was reminded that we had failed we had the failed martyrdom of Santa Chiara on in Nuri's talk a couple of days ago. Um, so that, in fact, I think failing in martyrdom is possibly almost as common as succeeding. But am I right in thinking that your point is that with martyrdom, even when you fail, you've succeeded at something, and that is why it's why it is an impossible failure. Um, I have a bunch of questions for you, Paolo. I'm only asking the one that is conversionary. Um, and that is that there were at least three elements in your stories that I have seen in a completely unrelated conversionary context. Um, and the ones that I noted were the, uh, the devil as the instigator of conversion, um, the idea that the loser of the debate has to convert, um, and the use of the small knife for circumcision or um, false stigmata in, in the case that I've seen. So I'm wondering if you can identify which aspects might be specific to your circumstances to 13th century Western Europe and which might be broader conversionary tropes that precede and post-date your research. What was the second one? Um, the loser of the debate has to convert. Okay, um, I just need the mic. Next time we all get body mics. <laughs> so I'm confident. I'm confident in saying that the the trope of the devil definitely precedes my period by a long shot, and surely continues after it. Especially Jews as being sort of in in the grips of the devil and acting uh, on his behalf. So that certainly is not special. Although although it, it emerges as a more prominent trope. Called in the 13th centuries. That's not new then. The small knife is very interesting to me because it appears in a ritual murder narratives as a torture implement. And I wonder if sometimes that could be um, the nice knife of circumcision that, that the writer has in mind. But I, I don't know what knives people used back then. I would have to look into the material culture side of things. But I, I have been struck by, and I've been collecting sort of the, the Latin and English and French terms in my sources for small knife to see if they're the exact same ones that are showing up, but it's not getting me anywhere so far. And the loser of the debate, I was actually just uh, rereading some of Chaim Haim's work on Ramon Lul and was uh, excited to find that apparently when he arrived in Tunis, Ramon Lul, who was hoping to convert Muslims, said, if you can convert, can, can, um, convince me of the security of Islam to Christianity, I'll convert to Islam. So, but I, that's the second, only the second case of that that I've, I've 
heard of apart from the Mallorca disputation, so I'd love to hear about in other contexts. I'm happy to talk about it, but what I want to know is, is that offer always made by Christians? So in my two paltry examples, it is, and they're both from the 1280s, 1290s in the south, and in Europe, North Africa. But does anybody else? Uh... Yeah. By Christians. Yeah. So Chaim and then Ora and their, then Sorry. I would like to thank all three uh, um, lecturers for their papers, but I would particularly also like to thank Piero, who uh, uh, in a way uh, sort of summed up very nicely. Right, or, or, or created a very, very uh, uh, broad but interesting framework for thinking about what we've been doing here over the last couple of days, and you did it very masterfully, uh, uh, Piero. But um, I, I would like to ask all three, in fact, this is more a general question than a, than a particular question, because I think what we heard, we heard here today was, or what we heard here in this panel in many ways was, um, or at least to my understanding, and not going to language as Piero did, but going to questions of identity. Right? Rather than rather than uh, 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 language, well, basically, uh, what I heard from all three papers was um, instability, uncertainty, um, doubt about one's own religious identity, right? which is then which is then expressed through imaginary devices, uh, marvels, um, fear of uh, the other, um, heretics who uh, imagined or imagined, I think, in, 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 uh, as, in, as in your cases. So, yes, conversion here is an excuse, but it's just one uh, um, aspect that can be used. But of course, there's an incredibly wide spectrum of, of ideas, concepts, uh, um, that can be used in order to uh, um, think about one's own one's own uh, identity. So I'm wondering whether uh, this is more comment or question. Right? Whether what we're really talking about here is uh, less about conversion or agency, conversion or agency, but actually about identity and doubt. Yeah, I go um so there's there's a vast literature when it comes to um, travel literature as literature there's a vast there's a, a vast scholarship on questions of the function of monstrosity and uh, marvels and whatnot and how it serves to or speaks to a sense of dis dis uh, instability and uh, anxiety with respect to uh, borders and identity and whatnot. Um, and while that is true, and of course it's an age, I the, the period I speak about, 14th century, is an age in which this uh, form of literature is uh, in high demand. I don't read these, I, my, the, these particular narratives as uh, when to speak of, uh, of um, I said that that, that, came, that particularly that kind of anxiety. I read them as something triumphal, or relatively triumphal, in the same way that again Marco Polo. Of course, there is a sense of instability and uh, kind of a marvel as to gazing at the other and being gazed by the other, and all these elements. But by and large, it's uh, it's an imperial text. Uh, it's uh, a text that celebrates the power of language to uh, sweep the world and so on. And I think this is the, these are an attempts to map questions of conversion or soteriology onto that uh, kind of uh, framework. Um, thank you for your comment. Um, I completely agree in, in terms of what we're seeing in the Burgundian Kingdom and, and the people that are speaking to us through these texts who were things considered very prominent, very senior members of a church that was considering itself to be beleaguered at that time by a variety of forces, some of which were doctrinal, others were um, political. So in, in that sense, I think what Abitus of Vienna is trying to do is to ascertain the most recent technology of salvation and doing that by trying to communicate with sources of authority, Constantinople and Rome, 
And, and he was right to be concerned because 10 years after he wrote, the kingdom came down. So certainly there is this constant anxiety and trying to, to latch on to what, what is perceived as some sort of uh, permanence. Uh, on the other hand, I, I tend to think that that reading, which I myself try to, to promote here, is, is, is somewhat cynical in, in the sense that it always looks at theology as an instrument of advancing some sort of political agenda. And I have to uh, agree that it, that's, it, it is part of it, but Avatar Sobyan and the people surrounding him were obviously very religious people for whom these things were of great importance in terms of their prospects to achieve salvation and, and, and their flock. So there's always uh, this dialectic intention. So I don't really have an answer for you, but um, just try and keep it balanced, I guess, and, and see both sides of the equation. Yes, I feel anxiety. I mean, my <laughs> sensing anxiety permeating my text, but anxiety not only about the agents of conversion, the Jews, which is what I focused on in my talk today, but really anxiety about the self and self-doubt. And um, a lot, a surprising number of texts, given the anti-Judaism of the period, talk about conversion to Judaism and never mention any Jews um, from during the 13th and especially the 14th centuries. And these are in Christian chronicles from across Europe, uh, many of them from Germany, and it's often tales of churchmen who, who convert to Judaism and suffer some kind of awful fate that um, gives us a preview of their eternal fate. But when you look closely, there are no Jews in the story. There's, it would have been so easy for the author to say that a Jew came and tempted him or bribed him or forced him, but there's no Jew. And so it's really, I think, reflecting um, self-doubt and, and concerns about the instability and lack of commitment of Christians mm -hmm. to Christianity. And uh, just to mention that in my research, Jewish anxieties about the instability of uh, Jewish identity are, are evident as well, and it's on both sides, and often they seem to be mirroring one another. There's a lot of uh, um, disagreement among Jews. Should we let apostates come back to Judaism? Should we let uh, prospective candidates for conversion enter the Jewish fold? It's not at all clear um, what these things mean and, and how they should be approached. So, Aura and then Ken, and I, I see that there were more questions, but unfortunately I'm not sure because I don't have time to, for more, so let's see. So just a small thing uh, to Yaniv, uh, I would like to thank you that for bringing in the, uh, the Aryans, because an, unlike all targeted uh, groups for mission, this, this mission was successful, uh, unlike all the other cases that we had in the Far East, Judaism from the Christian side, or, or, or Christianity from the Jewish side, or uh, Arianism was annihilated in a, in a way. And then we have to ask the question, how come? Because the, the, the battle between, the religious battle between Arianism and Catholicism was bitter. And, and uh, and because they are close, it is even more bitter because it's a, it's a battle within a family. And you can see in what you said that um, um, I think if Abitus says it or someone else that Aryan churches are not to be reused, and this is against what we know in, 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 in the early Middle Ages that uh, synagogues and pagan uh, shrines are reused by by Christians when they uh, they manage to 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 conquer the, the other religions, so this seems to be even a more bitter uh, battle. And are, so I'm interested about this point, and also the the idea of rebaptism, um, which is also very peculiar. So thank you, Ola, for your questions. Um, in, in terms of, of repurposing um, taken ecclesiastical property, uh, there's there's some precedent to, to, to canonical legislation on, on that on that question.
question, and you'd have to look to the Vandal Kingdom and the Aryans coming in in the early 5th century and uh, read Victor of Vida to, to see the kind of uh, impressions that that political move makes on, on the population. So when, when, the, when the Franks do this, when they uh, push out the Visigoths and then they gain control of Aquitaine, there's really no question of the Visigoths regrouping or coming back to, to, to constitute some sort of con concrete threat. So the Aryan clergy that's left in these places is basically faced with a very simple question, which is either to join the Catholics and undergo some sort of, of speed conversion, and then they can keep their ecclesiastical property. Priests remain priests, and this was a big thing in, in the Council of Orleans. Or, and I, I don't think violence was ever an issue, but it was more a threat of dissolution. So to, to, to dissolve the, the, Aryan, the Aryan church and to put some, somebody else in their place. And this would have been a fairly, you know, a fairly bad outcome for them. The Burgundians were never really a, a, a very prominent power player and the dynamics of, of, of the 6th uh, century Mediterranean. There were always more powerful players, and even within the um, Burgundian royal family, there was always this, this threat of Arianism making its return. So more than saying, um, more than understanding liter literally what they're saying, that we don't want to touch the churches because they're somehow polluted, what they are saying is, we don't want to touch the churches out of fear that sometime in the near future the Aryans will come back and then what will we do having taken these churches? So we're in a really bad spot now, so we might as well take this precaution. And so what I said is that the Catholics found other ways of making their point, such as um, monastic patronage with a very um, military undertone. But these are all in the realm of, of uh, metaphor and not actually taking things from people that you're later going to have to answer for. So I, I hope that um, answers your question. And on the, on the question of rebaptism, I mean, it's a, it's a total riddle. Obviously, Victor Avita, when you read the history of the persecutions, there's this uh, constant theme of, of the Aryans when they um, coerce unsuspecting Catholics into, into their perverted faith that they do this by rebaptism. So rebaptism is seen as a very extreme uh, measure. Um, obviously, baptism itself is something that's once it's done, it can be undone, it can be redone in any in any profound sense. So I think what what the, the canonical legislation is saying is that they're so far removed from communion, from what we perceive as being orthodox, that their uh, baptism <coughs> isn't really baptism unlike those people who are heretics but are closer heretics. And for them, we reserve chrism and the laying, laying on of the hands. But that's just my reading. I mean, I, I don't think there are actual, um, there's actual evidence that um, talks about how this actually plays out. So, yeah, it's all, it's all hypotheses, basically. And I'm going, I'm, I'm going to be very fast. Danny, please. Danny, I'm going to be very fast. I just want to mention the, uh, the uh, uh, motif of uh, losing a wager. There's the famous one of Oiseau of Liege. Now, I'm not sure if I remember exactly, it's in Blumenkrantz, whether that had to do with conversion on both sides. But in Megillat Achimatz, there is the Bishop of Oria against, I think it's uh, Shvati or Hananel. And uh, Hanania wins because God brings a cloud. Uh, so, but, but it's there, and it, it means it's there quite early. It's one of these mirror stories, and I think you can do that. I have a lot of comments about what Jews are converting in there, but that's for another time because the time is up. And I'm waiting for Dove. There's a, there is another one that in the uh, this, uh, no, disputation of Sylvester, uh, right in the. Uh, Oh, what's called? Uh, I'll give it to you all. Okay. I think William Rufus, uh, much earlier in England, also. So. Okay. So. Thank you very much, Bobby uh, Tal, for chairing, and to everyone for uh, all our panelists and our uh, Italian uh, respondents, who I think uh, were unaware of the rules, did very well. Um, we're going to end. Yeah. 
my dear friend, Piero, uh, I wish it, uh, at the beginning to, to say, uh, tu es Petrus, Piero Petrus, <laughs> et super Petra Ecclesia Medificao. Thank you very much for summarizing the conference, but I am not speaking in the name, name of God, of Christ, but rather on the name of the Apostle to the Gentiles, <laughs> then we have a kind of partook role between us. Uh, during almost five years of rich and intense activities of our Center for the Study of Conversions, conversions and Interreligious Encounters, we learned how difficult and complex it is to understand the conversion issue, whether perceived as a phenomenon of inner spiritual change or as a byproduct of external and often mundane factors, conversio, whether as a paradigmatic shift or as a long process of permutation of the religious status and or identity, resist to be only classified after the spiritualistic, individualistic, ideal type explanations given by William James, nor by merely socio-economic deterministic interpretations. Moreover, I think that even a awaited combination between both perspectives will never be completely satisfied, at least from my own perspective at the center, it appears that conversion, even when it was collective and forced, revealed the intervention of some unexpected factors, which cannot be always located within the individual self, nor in its external immediate contours. In other words, I think that the study of the conversion phenomenon underscores some interstitial black holes located between the individual and the social, corresponding to what the French philosopher Vladimir Yankelevich called je ne sais quoi, and I don't know what, intended as intangibility. Indeed, dear colleagues and friends, conversion appears to me as one of those particular moments of crisis, literally understood from the Greek as a deliberative and unstable situation in which merge some sparks of human irreductibility. Christian theologians call it grace. But we learned from our meetings that the je ne sais quoi is also found among all those who resist or negotiate their imposed conversion status before, during, and after the official religious permutation. This does not necessarily mean that we have to endorse metaphysics in order to approach the conversion conundrum. I fear that a mystification of the conversion phenomenon will put to an end our scholarly effort to avoid a dangerous reification supporting fundamentalism. However, an acknowledgement of the existence of some degree of mystery in the conversion process in our rational and empirical work must not be a moment of interpretative failure. On the contrary, I believe that conversion, with its moments of misery and plenitude, faith and doubt, oppression and liberation, displays a spasm of blessed indeterminacy or clinamen, so to speak, in an Epicurean mood. Let me remind you that spontaneité is what Ernest Cassirer characterized as specific to human beings capable to transcend an essential dependency on what is disclosed within experience. That said, whereas Cassirer's spontaneity is the energy of the human spirit expressed through culture and science, 
the conversion phenomenon shows that human spontaneity also appear in the most sublime and oppressive religious experiences and phenomena. In this sense, I believe that to study the conversion phenomenon from such non-deterministic open perspective could be an act of commitment to humanism, both in the restrained Benjaminian sense of giving the voice to those who are oppressed and forgotten in the name of God, but also in the more positive dimension given by Ernest Bloch as uncovering the not yet, not nicht creatures we are when we search after a transcending hope. I said transcending, not necessarily transcendental. If so, what the study of agents of conversion can teach us after four intense days of fascinating and rich lectures, after hearing my disgressive and rather lunatic introduction, don't expect from me to summarize the numerous and variegated contributions we heard and discussed all together. Let me just say that almost every meaning of the word agent was explored here from diverse chronological and geographical perspective, whether a synonym of intermediacy as emissary, envoy, go-betweeners, proxies, negotiators, brokers, liaisons, spokesmen, etc., or as a person or things that take an active role or produce a specific effect. Coming from the Latin verb agere, to do, to drive, to lead, but also to pass or to spend time, the word agent is neatly performative. It echoes the Sanskrit root ag, which also is associated with war. Therefore, whereas the term agent is intimately related to an idea of displaying forward a will or aim, conversion means a more circular and introspective restorative action. That is why Saint Jerome translates biblical teshuvah as conversio, return. Having the word agent, an intrinsic amount of intrusive violence, it is not surprising that we often employ it along with the term conversion. To the note that religion transformation often implies the participation of some external power. There are, however, two additional meanings of agency, which were disclosed here during our fruitful days. The first is that an agent is also an actor, and as a such, he is not, or it is not completely immune to the influence of the interaction. Let us just remember what appears uh, after hearing Joe Paul Rubia's portrait of the Jesuit Matteo Rich in China and of Agnieszka Jagodinska's typology of the London Society missionaries. Whereas the foreman ended his life almost converted to some of the cultural values he initially came to transform, the latter, uh, the latter abandoned any pretension of spiritual conversion in the name of an impenetrable grace, becoming logistic assistants and social workers of converted people. In the first case, religious agency led to acculturation, albeit not to religious syncretism, whereas the second case entailed a secularized perception of the evangelical vocation. Finally, by analyzing the atypical case of Schroeder, Alexander van der Heeven demonstrated through the fuzzy borderlines between gender transformation and religious conversion that the agency of one to another enabled him to understand his physiological change as part of a broader transcendental and upgrading cosmogony or conversion cosmogony. For the story of Schroeder is also the story of a deep expression of human spontaneity like all those who converted from one religion to another. Thank you. Please, no questions. <laughs> Thank you.